After reviewing some of the most applicable persuasion theories to crisis communication, we can begin to understand what shapes stakeholder attitudes in crises. However, concepts like threat, efficacy, message involvement, subjective norms, perceived behavioral controls, and behavioral intention are not merely individualized concepts. They're grounded by emotion. These theories align with some important research that's been done analyzing emotions and crisis communication. This research has found that, for example, stakeholder perceptions of their own and their organization's control over situations, along with uncertainty, affected not only emotional reactions to crises, but also attitudes and actions towards the organizations in crisis. At their heart, crises can be incredibly emotional for organizations and stakeholders alike, with a lot of emotionally charged communication. Though our understanding of the role that emotion plays in crises is still developing, there's an increased recognition that emotional reactions affect the outcomes of crises. This isn't surprising. For example, my own research has demonstrated that beliefs about stakeholder susceptibility, efficacy, and severity substantially and negatively affected how angry they were likely to be at both the issue and the organization at the onset of a crisis. However, some of the most vital work for advancing the field's understanding of emotion and crises has emerged from Jin and her research partners over the last several years. For example, in the development of the Social Mediated Crisis Communication Model, or SMCC, Jin and her colleagues provide instrumental insight into understanding the measures of emotions and types of emotional reactions to crises. In the context of stakeholder relationship management, SMCC very clearly links stakeholder attitudes about crisis issues and the organization to the production of emotional reactions to the crises. Key findings from the SMCC help to support a stakeholder relationship management approach to understanding the antecedents or causes of emotion and crisis. For example, the research finds that there is a strong positive relationship between attributions of blame and anger. That is, the more stakeholders attribute blame to an organization for a crisis, the more likely they are to be very angry about the situation. In particular, negative emotions produced increased stakeholder perceptions of risk, as well as their likelihood to take action. In a global environment, there are several individual factors identified across different studies as influencing emotional reactions to crises. One important study of individual factors within the tourism industry focused on what the authors called crisis-resistant tourists. That is, those people whose attitudes and planned behaviors were less likely to be affected by emerging crises. The researchers found that people who were more likely to generally take risks, travel more, were actively involved in their own travel planning, were younger, and interested in doing a number of different activities while on a holiday, were all less likely to perceive substantial risk from individual crises. This suggests that we must assume that individual factors like gender, age, income, experience with the crisis issue, and attitudes about the crisis issue are all likely to influence emotional reactions to crises. In addition, there is increasing evidence to suggest that media use is likely to influence people's reactions to crises, and so we need to better understand how traditional and social media use, both reading and posting, influence emotional reactions to crises. In fact, in a summary of emotions and emotional reactions to expect online, there are two key ways to classify reactions, those that were problem-focused and those that were emotion-focused. When we dig into emotion, we don't have to go too far before we begin to see the real impact that culture is likely to have on stakeholder reactions to crises. Understanding cultural identities is important because cultures give people the sense of belonging, provide guidelines for behavior, and a sense of morality or identity. Now, these identities can range from national, social, cultural, religious, and or political identities, and often influence a host of attitudes, including our understanding of situations, as well as our belief that we can control our own surroundings. Globally, one of the most important cultural factors shaping crises and conflicts is religion. There's a strong body of research suggesting that religion or religiosity 
which is an indicator of how religious identifications influence decision making, influences people's attitudes or perceptions. So depending on the nature of the crisis, understanding cultural values, applying common cultural dimensions like individualism, collectivism, uncertainty avoidance, power distance, masculinity and ethical ideology, or others value-based identities like political identities will be necessary if we're to fully understand stakeholder attitudes about issues or organizations. Though challenging, for crisis communication, the good news is that multinational organizations may be even able to avoid or managing crises by communicating more effectively with local populations based on what's important to those populations. Thus, intercultural crisis communication research represents an important development in both the fields of intercultural communication and crisis communication because intercultural issues fuel many of the conflicts at all levels of society and crises themselves are increasingly global. Moreover, insights into cultural differences can help researchers and practitioners understand variations in blame attribution and the communicative needs for organizations in crisis. Unfortunately, despite the importance of culture's influence on crisis communication, historically it represents a relatively small proportion of the research connected to crisis communication. This gives you a rough snapshot of how key concepts related to culture and religion have been covered in crisis communication research. In fact, studies of the impact of religious identities and preferences don't even emerge as a critical concept studied in the context of crisis communication. Between 1950 and 2015, for example, I found fewer than 10 individual peer-reviewed journal articles focusing specifically on religion and crisis communication. The need for more intercultural crisis communication research is strengthened when we consider a few key findings on the influence of culture and religion. For example, previous research demonstrates that both culture and religion influence people's attitudes and perceptions. This suggests that multinational organizations may be able to avoid crises by communicating more effectively with local populations. Additionally, Croucher's study posits that conflict management, a construct related to crises, is influenced by religion as well. Yet to date, very little empirical research directly analyzes the influence of religious identifications and crisis communication. However, case studies do indicate that stakeholders are likely to react negatively when crises or their related issues violate the religious beliefs of stakeholders.